Whenever there's an ordination, it makes you stop and think about the principle of renunciation. For many of us, the word renunciation sounds like deprivation. But in the Buddhist teachings, it's a kind of trade. You're renouncing your search for your happiness in sensual pleasures, in your fascination with thinking about sensual pleasures, the pleasures of sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. And you're going to look for your pleasure and happiness inside, in the mind. Now, there's part of the mind that would like to say, well, why can't we have it all? The pleasures of the senses, the pleasures of thinking about sensuality, and the pleasures of deeper concentration, insight, release. But those pleasures work at cross purposes. The simple fact of ordaining doesn't mean you're going to be deprived of sens sensory pleasures. They're still there, as people provide you with the requisites of life. But you try to keep that side of your fascination as limited as possible. Thinking thoughts of sensuality, getting resolved on sensuality, is part of the wrong path. The right path is renunciation. And it's important that you do read. Guard it as a trade. It's going to be one or the other. And the pleasures of renunciation are much greater, go much deeper, are much more satisfying. The act of taking ordination recognizes that fact. It's good to remind yourself again and again that this is where the ultimate happiness lies. There are three stories in the canon that illustrate this principle. They all have to do with sleeping soundly. The first one has to do with Badia, former king, sits under the tree, now that he's a monk, sits under the tree, and says, What bliss, what bliss. The other monks hear this and they're concerned. He's probably thinking about the pleasures of the time when he was king. So they report this to the Buddha. The Buddha calls Padie and then asks him, Why do you sit under a tree saying, What bliss, what bliss? And Padie says, Well, back when I was king, even though I had guards stationed in the palace, outside the palace, in the city, outside the city, in the countryside, outside the countryside, even so I couldn't sleep properly for fear that someone might attack. You never know about those guards themselves. But now he says, I sit under a tree. My needs are met by the gifts of others. My mind is free like a wild deer. So that's the pleasure that comes simply from not laying claim to a lot of things that other people would want. You don't have the fears, you don't have the worries. And there's a lightness that goes with that. However, the pleasures of renunciation go a lot deeper than that. There's another story where the Buddha has been sleeping outside in the cold, and a young man comes the next morning and asks him, Did you sleep well last night? The Buddha says, Yes, I slept quite well. He says, How could you sleep well? The ground is hard. The wind is cold. And the Buddha gave him an example. Suppose there were a young man. This time not a king, but a wealthy young man, sleeping in a house sealed away from the wind, sealed away from the cold, with all the luxury that you could think of in a bed in those days, plus his four wives to attend to him. Would he sleep well? And the young man he's talking to says, Oh, yes. But then the Buddha says, well, What about the Fevers that are born of passion, aversion, and delusion, could they keep him awake, keep him from sleeping well? Well, yes, that's true. The Buddha said in the mind of the Tathagata, those, those fevers are 
banished. In other words, the mind is not disturbed by anything at all. That's the noble attainment of the Buddha. A mind that's free from fevers, free from all the disturbance of the defilements. So renunciation is basically freedom in its highest form. So that's where the practice is aimed, at a mind that has that freedom. But in the meantime, before you get there, the Buddha also recommends two practices in particular that compensate for the fact that you're not able to indulge in the pleasures of the senses and indulge in your thoughts of sensuality, your, your plans, your resolves in sensuality. It comes in a story where a Brahmin notices that the Buddha seems to be healthy. His eyes are bright, his complexion is bright. And he says, you must get to sleep on really nice, high and luxurious beds as a Buddha. And then he goes into a description of what counted as a nice bed back in those days. And the Buddha said, those kinds of beds are forbidden in my teaching, but there's another kind of high and luxurious bed. In fact, there are three that the Buddha is able to enjoy. The first one he calls his divine bed, which are the four jhanas, the pleasure, the rapture, the equanimity that you can develop as you get the mind into concentration. This is much better than any high and luxurious bed that the world can offer outside. What this means, of course, is that you're giving up your pursuit of pleasure in thoughts of sensuality. You've got to replace it with skill, the skill of getting the mind centered, getting the mind to settle down and to find satisfaction in being with one thing, undisturbed. Just being able to enjoy the pleasure of having the mind settled in. So when thoughts of sensuality seem attractive, you have to remind yourself, there is a better way of finding pleasure, and it's right here. It's right here with your breath. Focus on the breath. Keep your thoughts on the breath. Keep your thoughts on nothing but the breath, and evaluate it. How is it going right now? What could I do to make it better, more satisfying? And as you get more and more absorbed in the breath, more and more absorbed in the process of getting the mind to settle with the breath, there's a strong sense of well-being that comes. And then you can allow that to bathe the body run through all the body, from the top of the head down to the tips of the toes, all around. And you can tap into that without having to have things outside adjusted like this, like that. You don't have to lay claim to anything outside. You don't have to take anything from anyone outside. There's a strong sense of well-being that comes with this. This is not the ultimate of the Buddha's high and luxurious beds. But it's the kind of well-being that can come only through the principle of renunciation. After all, right concentration begins with putting aside thoughts of sensuality, putting aside unskillful mental states. You can't get this pleasure unless you can say no to the pursuit of sensual fantasies. Because that's what sensuality is in the Buddhist teachings, it's your fascination with your sensual fantasies. You have to learn how to say no to that, and only then does this other pleasure open up to you. So that's one of the Buddhist high and luxurious pets. The other one is the Brahma Viharas. You can't get the mind into jhana quite yet. You can, at the very least, think thoughts of goodwill for everybody. The Buddha calls this his Brahma bed. And 
realize that for all of us, happiness has to be found within. And the pursuit of true happiness is something that everybody can do without conflict. In other words, your true happiness doesn't have to conflict with anyone else's true happiness. That right there is a comfortable thought, because the thoughts of the world are simply, how can I gain something and not let other people take it away? You gain something someone else has to lose. They gain, you lose. It's because of sensuality that we have wars. People wanting war, which is crazy. Because of sensuality. Their desires for sensuality are more, so much more important to them. They don't care who's harmed. They learn to see the harming of others as inevitable. But when you look for your happiness inside, that pursuit of happiness doesn't have to harm anybody at all. It doesn't have to take anything away. In fact, the more you find a sense of well-being inside, the more you have to offer to others. So you can think those thoughts, which allow you to have goodwill for everybody, compassion for everybody, empathetic joy for all those who are happy. And then equanimity. When you realize it's going to be up to each of us to make this choice. When you've chosen the path of renunciation, it doesn't mean that everybody else in the world is going to choose it. There's only so much you can do. But what you are doing in your pursuit of happiness is harming nobody. That thought allows you to be equanimous. So renunciation is a trade. And it's a good trade. It's a trade-up. You're trading candy for gold. You're abandoning the fears and worries that come with trying to lay claim to power, lay claim to material things. And you're finding your pleasure elsewhere, in safe places, inside you, your experience of the body and the mind as you experience it from within, an area where no one else can enter, no one else can sense. If you're looking for your pleasures outside, people can see the material things you have, and they can want them. When you're looking for pleasure inside, it's nobody else's business, which just means it's safe. Nobody else has to know. But you've developed your resources inside, through the Brahma Viharas, through the practice of jhana, right concentration, until you get to that third high and luxurious bed of the Buddhas, which is the noble bed, where the mind is free from its affluence. In other words, no longer any dangers from outside, and also no dangers coming up from within. That's the ultimate total freedom, total happiness. And it's odd that the word renunciation, which has the connotation of deprivation, actually leads to a happiness where there's no deprivation at all. <laughs>